So quantum computing seems to be kind of in a weird place right now. There's super basic applications, and then there's very theoretical, very high level, very complex applications. And I think because of this gap, there's kind of a, a lot of misconceptions that come out of the quantum computing field because it's hard to transfer and jump immediately from the very basic gap to the very, very complex. So in this video, I wanted to clear up a few myths that I hear a lot about quantum technologies. So if you like this video or were surprised about anything, make sure to hit that like button. It helps me a lot. And remember, friends don't let friends believe in superluminal quantum communication. So myth number one is quantum computers will replace classical computers. Or maybe part of that myth is that everyone will have a quantum computer in their home. Now, I would say this is not totally a myth, but maybe a little bit of a misconception, and it comes down to people not really understanding what quantum computing can do. Quantum computing can be applied to a few algorithms and actually is more efficient only for those algorithms. Those algorithms, of course, can be very impactful. They cover maybe machine learning, optimization, quantum chemistry, but not necessarily everyone will have them in their home. So because a quantum computer is not inherently faster than a classical computer for everything, there's really no reason to have a quantum computer in your home and used for everything, including applications where it's not faster than a classical machine. Quantum computers are very, very expensive. So why would you pay $10 million for one that is decoheres very quickly and is not faster? However, I'm saying that with what we know right now. So what if in the future we find a way to scale quantum computers to tens of millions, hundreds of millions, a billion qubits? Maybe then quantum computers can actually replace qu classical machines. If it gets to that level and quantum computers get to be cheap enough where maybe they're actually replacing classical computers, maybe they're cheaper and easier to control. But right now with what I see, I don't think it'll be possible in the near term future. Quantum computers are massive and have to be held at either low temperatures or low pressures. And even though the chip itself is actually pretty small, the surrounding equipment, so on this creostat here, that's all the surrounding equipment. The chip itself is actually pretty small, like your computer chips, but it needs all that to function. So because of this, all of a sudden, it doesn't mean you're gonna take a whole room in your house and replace it with a quantum computer if you're not actually using those applications, like the quantum chemistry one, for example. Maybe one day, but to me, this is still a myth. Myth number two is that quantum artificial intelligence will take over the world and destroy everything. Again, I think this comes down to the idea of quantum computers can actually speed everything up and they can speed everything up very, very quickly. However, not all quantum computers, quantum algorithms have the same effect on algorithms that we know. So for example, Shor's algorithm, which can actually crack RSA and elliptic curve encryption is an exponential speed up. So something that will take millions of years would take seconds. However, Grover's algorithm is only a quadratic speed up, which means it's gonna be a little bit faster, of course, but it's not as crazy of a speed up like Shor's algorithm is for that application. And for quantum machine learning specifically, again, we are seeing that it's probably most likely that the biggest effect quantum technology will have on machine learning is actually when we're doing quantum machine learning on quantum data, which means at this point, it's not likely to have a general effect on all machine learning technologies. I think a lot of people assume that the brain is quantum and in some way, kind of everything is. And the brain is made up of atoms and molecules and those can be modeled by quantum systems. And of course, what we know right now are models of neurons and the brain, they're kind of simplified models, but they work really well for what we need to do. But is quantum physics really the key to explaining consciousness? So to me, this actually seems like a pretty contentious question. And scientists are both for and against. So for on one hand, neuroscientists haven't really found the most correct or the truth model of cognition. So why can't it be quantum physics? However, there have been experiments done in the brain and actually looking at these quantum states in the brain. And what's been found so far is that these quantum states don't last long enough for any meaningful processing. So, so far with the information that we do know about the brain and the quantum physics of the brain that we know so far, of course, this is all as we know so far, there doesn't seem to be any evidence to support this besides why not? We haven't found any other explanation. However, if quantum physics and quantum computers were really the key to actually unlocking the mysteries of consciousness, I still wouldn't worry about quantum computers taking this over just due to the hardware and the realities of scaling these systems. With the way that we're thinking about the model of the brain, and it's simplified a little bit so far, but even if we could model every atom in the brain, we would need so many qubits to do these calculations, and the technology is just not there yet. 
even proteins we can't model right now, even larger molecules. We can do quantum calculations and quantum chemistry on some small systems and we are scaling up, but the amount of atoms that a brain has is massive. There's a lot of steps that we need to do first, first in the scaling aspect and the quantum error correction aspect. So I think we're pretty safe for the time being about a quantum AGI taking over the world. There's pretty much consensus in the quantum machine learning community that this is not a near term application of quantum computing. And where quantum machine learning does have an advantage over classical machine learning data, it's more likely going to be affected in those limited cases, including the quantum data. So again, not out of the question, but what we know so far, we probably need to get to the classical AGI to take over the world first or get close to it before the quantum one can actually take that quantum data and do something crazy with it. Myth number three is that quantum communication is faster than the speed of light. This is one I hear all the time and this one actually really gets to me. And let me tell you, it's not, but it may seem that way and I understand why there's so much confusion there. The usual way that this is explained in popular science is that you have a red light and a blue light and you put them in two different boxes and you take one box with you, you know, a million years, light years away in this direction and leave the box over here. When you open your own box and you see a red light, you go, oh, I immediately know that there's a blue light in that location. So you go, oh, now I have a new knowledge that is faster than the speed of light. I'm a million light years away, but I immediately know I have that knowledge. In this example, that does seem like faster than the speed of light information transfer. However, the key here in this example and why this doesn't work and why quantum is so different for classical, it's hard to kind of put together a good model to understand this. The problem is in quantum information is that number one, we can't actually force an entangled particle into a particular state. And number two, we can't actually force a measurement to produce a particular outcome. And that's what really this red and blue light experiment kind of does in both ways is that we force a measurement by the opening of the box. And we also force the states of the two to be anti-correlated, that one's red and one's blue, and we can't do that. So sure, the states actually can collapse in quantum information and there's some sort of measurement there, but without a classical channel, we can't actually know how those measurements are correlated. And that classical channel is limited by the speed of light. And this classical channel tells us how things are correlated and what measurements we actually need to do to get that communication. I think the best small demonstration of this and really getting a deeper understanding of this is actually quantum teleportation. And I made a tutorial video on that, so check that out here. Myth number four is that quantum computers will break encryption in two to three years. And no, I don't think this is common barring any sort of crazy circumstances that come out. But from what I know of the research and being very deeply involved in the field, I don't see a way that we're going to get there from what I know. Of course, some people are here saying that there's already governments out there that have quantum computers that are 10 million qubits and they can do all this already, but there's no evidence of that. And you can always give an argument like that, but from what we know so far and thinking that if someone has already found out how to do it, at least we'd be kind of closer on the path to it now, I don't think this is a realistic timeline. And where one of this misconception comes from is the fact that when we talk about the number of qubits to break RSA or elliptic curve encryption, we talk about the number of logical qubits and people forget about error correction. I know I talk about this a lot in my videos and those who have been here since the beginning see me hammering in this point in pretty much every video. Yes, it takes 4,000 qubits to break RSA encryption. And yes, it takes 2,500 qubits to break elliptic curve encryption, but that's logical qubits and not counting error correction. You need a lot more physical qubits for error correction up to some estimates say two to 10 million. So when you look at these roadmaps now where they say, oh, we're gonna get to 2000 qubits in five years, you go, oh no, we might br actually break encryption in that time. But you, do, you realize then that like the quantum error correction part of it is not part of it. So we're still a little bit away. And myth number five, quantum computers can mine Bitcoin faster. This one again is one of the ones that really gets to me because I see everyone's getting all these likes talking about this and I'm just like, no, 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 please, please, like, listen, it's not using elliptic curve. And this comes down to maybe a misunderstanding of the Bitcoin technology and again, a misunderstanding of what quantum computing can be applied to. Mining Bitcoin is a completely different process from spending Bitcoin. Spending Bitcoin does use elliptic curve encryption, and I've talked about this in one of my other videos and actually gone through all of this there. Mining, however, actually uses SHA-256, which is a hashing algorithm. So what this algorithm does is it takes an input and produces an output of fixed size. And they're actually very powerful because it's one way. 
it will always give you the same result if you put in the first initial string that's exactly the same. But it's really hard to reconstruct it backwards. So you see the hash, it's very hard to know what the actual initial message was. So what mining does, it actually tries to find the original message by guessing the nonce. And this is totally different from Shor's algorithm where this is encryption, right? So you have an encryption key and decryption. So right now there's no known algorithm that can actually crack SHA-256 faster than a classical machine. So a lot of people here say, well, what about Grover's algorithm? Grover's algorithm does search, so it can do anything. Even then, Grover's algorithm can't actually be applied to anything. We call it a searching algorithm, but it's actually inverting a function. And this is a little bit of a different approach. So it's not just searching faster or parallelizing. But say you're right, we do find a way to actually do SHA-256 decryption using a quantum computer using Grover's algorithm. It's only a quadratic speedup. So it would weaken SHA-256 to SHA-128, but that's still pretty large and we can actually double the keys to get back to the same security. But a point here that I want to say is that there's actually classical collision algorithms that actually work better than Grover's algorithm would if we could even apply Grover's algorithm to this. So to me, comparing the quantum Grover's algorithm, just doing the plain search and knowing there's a classical collision algorithm that's faster, well, even if we could do that, we're not really going to see any benefit here. And again, as I talk here about all these things, this is from what we know right now. But also, there is some sort of quantum intuition, and having been in this field for a while, I feel like it's less likely that we're actually going to find a new algorithm that can actually undo hashing, just from the way that quantum technology actually works and how the math behind quantum computing actually works. It's not impossible, but it's one of those problems that I just don't think is going to be the most likely candidate to find new quantum algorithms. So let me know, which of these myths have you heard a lot? Let me know down below, comment, tell me which ones you've heard of these and any other ones, and I can maybe answer that in my next video. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate it very much and subscribe.